campfire, we sing songs. It's helped me grow a lot closer to God. We learned a lot about like Bible and things Jesus would say to us to do. You can have God time anytime. campfire and we are singing Sanctuary, which is a classic, just everybody loves it to sing at a campfire. And at the end of the song, the campfire just kind of like grew almost, but like no one had put anything into it and no one had like touched it or messed with it. So it's kind of just like God was saying that he was there and he was listening. Early bird drawing for camp is coming up here pretty quick, the, uh, the end of it. So if you got kids or grandkids, or uh, they even have some camps for us old people. So um, if you want to get in on that, uh, certainly I was involved in camping ministry for a number of years. And uh, so when's, uh, when's the deadline on that, Lily? April 30th. April 30th. Okay, so the end of the month. All right, uh, announcements. Are there any announcements? Keep your hat on. Becky. Oh. You know, when I, I, I got to tell you, Michael, when I turned 18, I've never missed an election since. It's my constitutional right, and I exercise it. Um, my side doesn't always win, and that's kind of the breaks of it, but that's the way it goes. Okay. Any other Announcements. That's an accomplishment, by the way, you're getting up there. <clears throat> okay, if there's none other, I'd like to greet you in Jesus' name. And right now, we're just going to kind of center down as we prepare to worship our Lord.
let us stand and join together in opening hymn number 102, Now Thank We All Our God. may be seated. Now it happened that he was praying alone, alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do people say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets of old has risen. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ of God. But he charged and commanded them to tell no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in glory and with the glory of his Father and his holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here that will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. And of course, Jesus was talking about that coming kingdom of his, and when they went out into the world and began to convert and began the church began to grow, people actually seen the coming of his kingdom. The title of my message is A Call to Action. When I was an early Christian and I um, attended Hope United Methodist Church in Hastings, Michigan, um, we had received some training about how to share your faith through Campus Crusade Through Christ and Belbright Ministries. And at the end of that training uh, seminar, which took place all day Saturday, we went through the workbook. Saturday evening, they sent you out with two in twos to go out and knock on people's door and share your faith. And I was with a lady who was a little bit older than me. Um, she was in her late 40s, and I was still in my late 20s. And uh, her name was uh, uh, Bev Brooks. And we went out, we knocked on some doors, and a few people didn't want to talk to us. And there was a Mormon couple at one um, place. And, 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 but, you know, we, we, we had some good responses. And then we came to this one household, and they asked us in. And I could tell that he kind of had a burr under his saddle about something. And so I asked him, and he says, well... 
The problem I have with the church is all preachers ever talk about is money. And uh, I've been here since July. I haven't talked about that yet, but you're about to get it. So, uh, um, but the, this, you know, God's either got a sense of humor or he puts his finger down right on the issue that we have. So I got to talk with him and I got to share my faith and I says, I'm not here to take an offering. I'm not even here to invite you to my church. But I want to know, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And him and his wife prayed to receive Christ right there. Two weeks later, he shows up at church. What does the pastor preach on? Money. Never came back. And that's the first time I remember that the pastor ever talked about it. Now, the, the good part of this story was about six months later, him and his wife did begin to attend another church and are still active to this day. Well, I shouldn't say that. They're probably dead now because they were well up in their 60s. And that's quite a few years ago. But they did right up, uh, became very active. <clears throat> Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now there's that cliche, there's that expression, this is my cross to bear, and it refers to the problems we sometimes have in life. Um, to be sure, sure, Jesus said, in this world you have tribulation. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about the vagaries of life and how they sometimes affect us. He's talking about Christ-bearing discipleship is different. Now, when I play paintball with my friends down in uh, Missouri, they used to always say to me, um, and my call sign was, was, Jackie, you need to go out and reconnoiter ahead of the column. Well, they wanted me to go out and see what I was facing, and usually that meant I was going to get shot because somebody's going to be out there waiting for me. Well, how do we as Christians reconnoiter? Well, God's Word says we are to say certain things, do certain things. Certain things have been revealed to us about who God is, what He's done for us. Um, there's all kinds of things in His Word, instruction, etc. Um, and the question we need to ask ourselves is, am I the real deal when it comes to being a disciple? Or am I settling for something far less? Am I settling for merely institutional religion or of a human creation, or am I an authentic follower? I'm going to take us a break right here, and we're going to have a word of prayer. <clears throat> and then we're going to go back to the message. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I often hear your words, but they sometimes never get past my ears. Sometimes I think I get it, and yet I buy into the views of this world. So Lord, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you do a deeper work in my life, cut past my phoniness and my excuses. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I took a Christian financial concepts course at uh, the Lighthouse Christian Fellowship in Rosemount, Minnesota, a number of years ago, and it, it, it boiled down to, and the, and the person who was teaching it said, what this all boils down to is, in life, just spend less than what you make. Well, that's a good principle, really. It'll keep you out of trouble. But, and at face value, it's good advice, but can a person be debt-free and still not be in God's will? Well, the answer to that question is yes. So let's look at spending habits a little bit. Um... I have a, a, a cousin who pastored a, a, a very lar one of the largest Methodist churches in, in the United States uh, down in the, in the Dayton, Cincinnati area, Michael Slaughter at Ginghamsburg Church, and he's retired a couple of years ago, and, uh, but he's involved in some mentorships with other pastors, and he's a mentor of, of Charlie Moore's up here at Sunnycrest Church in Sioux Falls. And one of the things that, that I've heard that mentors do when they're mentoring another pastor, is they'll sit down and say, I want to look at your checkbook. And they'll go through it. And the reason being is, is that tells us, or that tells them, what your priorities are. I, I believe there is no greater gauge. It is a window into our worldview. We're either going to have a worldview of two kinds. Our passions will go into pursuit of worldly things, or we'll seek treasures in heaven 
where Jesus said neither moth nor rust can consume. Um, people oftentimes mortgage their future with debt, uh, and they buy things that merely wear out. Uh, and marriage counseling, I have with young couples that are to be married, I've run into a lot of them that buy too expensive of automobiles, houses, and appliances, and kind of gets them into trouble. Um, a classmate of my daughter, Megan's, in fact, I had her in youth group when I was up in uh, Cavalier in North Dakota, and she wound up marrying a physician. He's an emergency room physician, and uh, he come out of med school about $500,000 in debt. Now, that sounds like a huge amount of money, but um, I got to say something about med school, and Doc Berg can uh, vouch for this. Um, you don't get a second or third job when you're going to med school. That is your job. <laughs> you are tied up. You are working. Um, and, and, and it takes all of your time. And, and he shared that with me. Um, but that $500,000 debt he's going to have paid off in a little over five years. Now, granted, that $500,000, he's making a little more than that a year. But I asked him, I says, how come so many doctors complain about their school debt when their income levels allow them to pay it off so quick. And he said, well, I'll tell you why. He said, they go out and buy one, two, three million dollar houses, fancy cars, take trips and all this. Love. He just gave me a litany of what he sees many of his peers fall into. He said, my wife and I decide we're going to get debt free and we're going to take a lot of our money, use it for the kingdom of God. They're Christians. Matthew 7, 14, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life eternal and few find it. It boils down to a trust of sacrifice. Do you consider God in your spending plans? Is his kingdom your first priority or just an afterthought? It's not my intent to tell you that if you are faithful and that you give, God will bless you materially and you will have more money. That is selfish, that is prosperity theology, and it is not the gospel. And some preachers have taught that, unfortunately. Now, what John Wesley realized with a lot of his followers was they were better off financially because they weren't spending their money on gin or, or, or whoremongering or things like that were going on in England during his time. They were living better lives. And as a result, they prospered. But the challenge is one's worldview, and will we replace it with the cross? Let's look at the cost of the cross. Everything in Christianity comes down to that. It goes back to the cross. In Mel Gibson's book, The Passion of Christ, the political correctness got into that because during the, during the scene when, when, the, when the people are yelling for Jesus, to be crucified and to give them Barabbas, they made a comment in one of the Gospels that they said, let his blood be upon our heads. And Jewish people found that very offensive and wanted that taken out. It created such a controversy in our PC culture. People don't like the hard sayings of Jesus when they want to talk about love and not talking about cross-bearing discipleship. And the cross is not an icon, something we wear around our neck or have it silk screened on our shirt. Isaiah said about the Messiah in chapter 53, he was despised and rejected by others, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. He was wounded for our transgression, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his stripes we are healed. And we all, like sheep, have gone astray and have turned to our own way. We can never let the cross be reduced to an art form. In India, the government is now controlled by a party that's radically Hindu, and they're upset with the Christians because too many Dalits and untouchables, that's the bottom of the caste order, are being converted. So now when I give money to Arthur, it has to be given through the Bank of India so that they can keep track of all the dollars being spent 
by Christian missionaries in that country. It's one step away from being cut off. But let me tell you something about the persecution and cross-bearing discipleship. Every time governments and other religions and agencies try to put the thumbscrews to Christians, all it does is spread. It has the exact opposite effect. You see, Jesus is demonstrating by his life that life isn't about you and I. Jesus' coming was not about getting what I want out of life. There's nothing wrong with some of that. Not being placed here to consume and merely wait for heaven. We are called to make disciples, Matthew 28, and the meaning of that is found in sacrifice. It's a call to commitment, delayed gratification, discipline on our part, planning, and prayer. Do we pray when we go to make a big expenditure? Do we pray? When I was at seminary, um, we were, our automobile, I had a Ford Pinto. And if you know anything about a Pinto, brand new it was 1800 bucks. That'll tell you an idea of what it was like. And, and it had cancer really bad. And I'll tell you how bad it had it. It's so rusty. I hit a mud puddle and got splattered in my face when I was driving. <clears throat> and one of the seats began to sink in the floor. So when I went home to my dad, we peeled out all the upholstery in the seats, and there were some big holes that just rotted right through, and we went down to the marine place and got us four gallons of, of fiberglass resin and about 15 yards of cloth and went to work and saved it so I could at least drive the crazy thing. Um, but prayer, do we pray before we give? Luke 9, 24, for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, will save it. I am not saying believing is not just an acknowledgement that Jesus existed. Believing, as it's brought out in the Scriptures, is about commitment. It's not just an intellectual activity. Action must go with believing, or we do not have genuine faith. It is both being and doing. When we baptize, we like to say that the symbolism of the water is, is dying to self, going down in the water and coming back alive to Christ. It must be his purpose in me. And that's a process. It's not instantaneous. Um, but don't waste your life on legacies that have no real meaning. Let it go. Now, I want to talk about tithing and missions and special kind of offerings and stuff like that. Now, buying some fish and stuff, taking your wife to a fancy night out, um, you know, buying some nice furniture, having a vacation, those things aren't bad. In fact, being rich is not bad. Scripture doesn't say that. It says what you do with it is what's important. But see, work in the kingdom becomes a force multiplier. The reason I love being involved in India is the number of people in the testimonies I read of people that have come to Jesus Christ. When I was in Bangalore, I was preaching through an interpreter, and I was preaching on the, the prodigal sons. And when I got to the part about killing the fatted calf, because there's a lot of Hindus there, I changed it to making a big pot of curry. Because um, Hindus would have found killing that calf pretty offensive. So sometimes I take a little liberty in the Scripture. You have to understand that. But this man come up to me, and he's, after I got done preaching, he's rattling off in canneries, and I haven't got any idea what this guy's saying. So I got one of the mysteries over here, uh, missionaries, and I said, what's this guy talking about? And they chatted back and forth, and he looked at me, and he says, he wants to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And I said, well, let's sign him up, you know. And uh, so we got down there on our knees and prayed with that man, and I prayed through an interpreter and led him to Jesus Christ. Um, and then they brought him into a, to a class right away. Because what happens sometimes with Hindus is they have a tendency to just make Jesus one more God in their pantheon. <clears throat> so we got to get in somehow the exclusivity of, you know, have no other gods before me. The resurrection, friends, would have never happened if it hadn't been for the cross. Jesus says, I'm going to die, and in three days I will rise up again. Never happens without the cross. That's the way life is as a Christian. It always has to go through the cross. Now, 
Last point, bass boats and delayed gratification. Money demonstrates the priorities of life. Now, after my third sermon I preached here at Winter, you probably come to realize I like to fish. Or as Wade Burt said this morning, well, I got that after the first sermon. <clears throat> but when I was involved in the Bass Federation, I had this little teeny boat and and so when we came to big tournaments, I always got in with somebody else and fished in their boat. And uh, a, a fella asked me, he says, why, why haven't you bought a, 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 a bigger and a, a nicer boat, John? And I says, well, because a tithe. He didn't have no idea what that was. I had to explain it to him. And I says, I tie the new bass boat every two years. Current prices, that's about every 10. Um, and they asked me, why would you do that? because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I believe my recreation, and I do enjoy my recreation, and I do enjoy fishing, and I own a boat. It's an older boat. Should never exceed our giving to the kingdom of God. Every spending decision is a spiritual one. Doesn't mean you can't enjoy things in life. As my cousin Michael Slaughter, as I shared with his mentorship, he bought a Harley-Davidson motorcycle, but he took nine years to save for it. Jesus said, it is very hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. When it comes down to, is this is not just what is up here, but what we do with our faith. How can I demonstrate my faith through my giving? Um, and, and, and that's not the only thing. When we take membership vows, we deal with our time, our talents, our treasure. I had a, a young, well, they used to be young. They're kind of, they were my age. When I was up at Faith, that's getting to be a lot of years, but um, he's a few years, a few months older than I am. Um, they're small ranchers, small potatoes, and had a relatively low income. And they couldn't give much, but they both worked in the church. Um, and, and so, you know, it just depends how God blesses us. And one person uh, may not give much, but that may be a lot, as Jesus in the story of the two women, the widow's mites. So how can I demonstrate my faith by giving? First of all, I think practice delayed gratification. Uh, avoid the big trips, the autos, the houses, and, and the fancy toys, and doing it all on borrowed income. Of course, with a house, I don't know how you get around that, but you've got to have a place to live. Try to make tithing or regular giving your goal, and I could care less if you tithe on the net or the gross or the gross net in case of a business owner or a, or, or a land you, or like a farmer. If you're not there, move towards it. Develop a plan to get there. Third, special giving. This can be regular or as the need arises. There's God giving, you know, missional causes. Um, and, and, and in mission causes, try to be involved in a, in a mission organization that is evangelistic and involved in church planning and not just social issues. Those are fine. There's a place for that, but not exclusively that. Okay, so there's good giving. Then there's, or that's God giving, and then there's good giving. And, and my belief is this should never exceed our God giving. Um, I had a lady, Dorothy was her name in my, my church in uh, uh, Canastota, and she was sharing with me one time, she says, Pastor, I can't give anything to the church because I'm given to every disabled person and, and veterans organ. And those things are wonderful organizations. You know, I, you know if you want to give to that, do it. Um, school, um, she, you know, she was always trying to do things up at school, and our schools need that. Um, you know, I had one, a couple of people gave to the Shriners Hospital. I, I had two young children in the churches I've served that had major surgeries paid for by the Shriners. That's good giving. But good giving should never exceed our God giving. The kingdom of God is always for the Christian, Christ first, God first, and our life second. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, um, it's hard in the society we live in because advertising everything is 
always putting stuff in front of our face saying you need this, you need that, you got to have this, you got to have that. Really half the time we don't need this or that or the other thing. Um, so Lord, speak to each one of our hearts and it may be different um, about what we can do to be good stewards with what you've blessed us with. Um, I just pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let us uh, stand and join in our hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, Holy Consecrated to Thee. Number 399. May be seated. Are there any prayer needs we need to lift up this morning? Anyone have a need? All right. Let us join together in that prayer. Our Lord taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand for our concluding hymn, Rise Up, O Men of God. And that certainly we conclude the ladies in that too. As you leave this place, pick up your cross, carry it, for Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in his peace.